siblings. We all got something to fight about. And I'm not just saying that. Most siblings incur a rivalry at some point in time. Doesn't matter how close you are to your sibling, eventually some point in your life, there will be a rivalry. And in the automotive industry, there's a lot of sibling rivalries. Now we've already talked about platforms and utilizing same platforms to build multitude of cars, plus car marriages between two car companies building a similar product to compete in the same market. But siblings, the same car from the same company, or ones built to do battle against each other in the marketplace by two separate companies. Sibling rivalries have been around since the existence of the automobile. And today, Autolux is going to take a look at why car companies build these rivalries within their own product ranges. <laughs> Welcome back to the Autolux Podcast. I'm your host, as always, the doctor to the automotive industry, Mr. Everett J, coming to you from our main host website at autolux.net. If you haven't been there, stop by, check it out, read some of the reviews, check out some of the ratings, and go to the Corporate Links website page to find car companies, big or small. We have them all on the Corporate Links website page, car companies from around the globe. Essentially, autolux.net is the Google of the automotive website industry. The Autolux Podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by Podbeam.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email over at email at autolux.net or find us on one of our major streaming sites around the globe from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram and even LinkedIn. You can find us all there on the Autolux Podcast. So like we said in the beginning, sibling rivalry. I know from my life that has been a major occurrence. My brother and I can't spend more than like three days together. When that fourth day hits, there's there's that rivalry just, just spawns back. You know, first three days, it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. But, like, by the fourth day, it's, like, literally neck and neck. And in the automotive industry, these exist. Siblings built by either two different car companies or the same company. Similar to that of the marriage that goes on between these companies or the platform sharing behind their development. Siblings are not only built to go head-to-head with each other, but siblings serve another purpose. Creating a sibling rivalry within your company, similar to that of the Pontiac Firebird and Chevrolet Camaro, or the Dodge Challenger, and Plymouth Barracuda. Sibling rivalries have been around, and they're useful on the automotive planes of gaining more market share. Everybody always believes you have to gain more market share through your one simple division. Well, that's true select markets, and in the Japanese marketplace, that was true amongst all the major automakers until the late 80s when they decided to branch out and open up their own luxury and premium brands. Now, there's similar siblings between luxury and standard makes. They could be a platform Forum shared technology to basically go after their select markets in both of their marketplaces. But siblings usually compete on the similar grounds. Like I said, the Chevrolet Camaro and Pontiac Firebird are one of the greatest sibling rivalries of all time. The two of them literally hate each other. And their divisions, although part of the major corporation that encompasses General Motors, Pontiac and Chevrolet is a bitter feud on the internal level. So siblings are part of the same marriage. My brother and I, essentially. So a Firebird and a Camaro compete on the same level. Pontiac was more of the sport brand, where Chevrolet was more of the base brand. But as time went on, there was really no difference between the two of them. They competed in the same part of the market. They competed on the same financial fields. Both of them were sold at similar prices. But why did General Motors want to have two of them? Well, it's the same with platform technology. You want to get the most bang for your buck. Similar to that, the car marriage between the Supra and the BMW Z4, those were built to share developmental costs. They needed to see that they can make a financial plan for both vehicles. Both of them on their own are not feasible for their corporations, but together they are. Siblings are similar to that. When you spend all this money building and developing this platform for the Camaro, you need to start looking at the marketplaces within General Motors Corporation. What other product ranges can we sell a product off of this platform in? And that happens a lot. And in the world today, there's a lot of car companies that still look at this if they have a multitude of divisions. A lot of them have been separating themselves out to essentially create their own niche in the marketplace. Well, that's all great. But at one point in time, we had a multitude of similar companies competing on the same level, all because the market was growing. If you own 15% of the market with Chevrolet and 10% with Pontiac, well, it's 25% of the market that General Motors owns in that marketplace. Chevrolet on its own may only be able to get 20% of that where 10% of the Pontiac owners wouldn't even buy a Chevrolet if they had to. 
Now, this is kind of an internal sibling rivalry that has existed. And in North America, it was a big thing because the big three owned so many different divisions and they competed on very similar levels within those different divisions. Like you can tell me all you want that Buick competes on a completely different level than Chevrolet today. But back in the 60s and 70s, premium really wasn't part of the marketplace. You can get a little more premium features in your Buick, but essentially your Buick was nothing much more than your standard Chevrolet product. So why not build products at the same level? Buick 442, Oldsmobile Cutlass, Chevrolet Chevelle, they all compete for that same part of the market. Different looks is the only thing that makes them different from each other. And back in those times, the market was growing and demand for all these products was out there. And this was true from the 60s, the 70s, and into the 80s. But the 90s started showcasing to us that sibling rivalries is on its way out. Eventually, we're going to have to start moving into marriages amongst car companies. And that bitter feud on the inside is going to start to branch out. But as we get these marriages between car companies, we also get a step-sibling rivalry. Where the Ford Focus and Mazda Protégé were built off the exact same platform, similar to that of the Ford Fusion and the Mazda Six. Internally, you had Ford competing with Mercury, but through a marriage, you had that step-sibling rivalry between the Fusion and the Six, Mazda and Ford. Through a marriage, they became siblings, and these two products became siblings to each other. Both companies wanted to be part of that marketplace, and both companies wanted to make sure that the consumers that they have, their demands would be met. Not just say, oh, well, we have the same product at Ford, go buy it from Ford because, well, they own us. No, this is Mazda saying, I want our own product product because we have dedicated Mazda people who will go to other Japanese brands, not American brands, to buy. So they will only buy from us, not our step-sibling. Or internally, people look at the Ford and look at the Mercury as being siblings, competing for similar markets. The sibling rivalry changed by the late 80s, and we were going from competing brands to ensure that we kept more of the market away from our competition by having an internal rivalry to consume all of the purchasers of the major general motors corporation to keep the Mustangs and Challengers at bay. This sibling rivalry eventually started to fade as more competition came out and people started looking towards the competition for their product. Now where the big three saw an advantage to getting into bed with a lot of these new imported vehicles instead of trying to compete with them on their level, they work with them on their level to learn their products. And by selling similar products, two different nameplates, you could still essentially own all the market for that segment of the marketplace. You can ensure that your platform, your marriage, and your rivalry all stays within the same part of the marketplace, ensuring that nobody else will try and jump in and steal it. Mazda has owned tons of the market share for roadsters globally since the late 90s, with only the Solstice and Sky coming in to compete recently. Those siblings fought for two different portions in the marketplace. Even though they were the same product, they looked different, and its consumers demanded different products. Products. The rivalry is still there with the Solstice and Sky, and the two of them both wanted to be the main product for the General Motors Corporation. Unfortunately, both divisions would pay the price of downsizing, and that sibling rivalry would come to an end. When it comes to the Camaro and Firebird, that rivalry is still going on strong today. Even though the Firebird doesn't exist, aftermarket companies still want to create that rivalry between the two of them, and by building a Pontiac Firebird out of a Camaro, and selling it as the Firebird of today, that rivalry still exists. Where people could still say, yeah, you may have a Camaro, but I got a Firebird. You got a burning chicken on the hood of your car. And even more internally for a rivalry was the difference between the Trans Am and the Firebird. Creating a bitter dispute amongst people within the own car company. Sometimes rivalries like this exist upon themselves. The CUV marketplace has really showed us a major rivalry even internally between companies. With now the active lifestyle vehicle marketplace competing against the CUV marketplaces, we get products back in the day like the Acura ZDX and the RDX. Same company, similar markets, and a bitter dispute. They wound up with only one of them winning. But why is that? One of them had to give away. And the active lifestyle vehicle marketplace wasn't there back then. 
Internal siblings can exist, and they can fight against each other. Each one of them wants more market share than the other. The Camaro wants to be known as the main muscle car of the General Motors Corporation. Today, that's true because it's the only one being produced by GM. Similar with the Mustang compared to the Ford Capri or even the original Mercury Cougar. You have to remember, the Cougar was originally built off a Mustang platform. We see, Mercury wanted their own muscle car. The word Mercury could just say, we'll go buy a Mustang. Some of those consumers would say, no, I'd rather go buy a freaking Camaro from Chevrolet rather than go to Ford. I have heard this and I've seen this. I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, little Calvins peeing on logos. I actually saw one on the back of a Jeep and it was Calvin pissing on a Dodge logo and I'm like, you guys do know you're part of the same company, right? Jeep is owned by Chrysler Corporation which is now Stellantis, but still, Dodge is in the same bed as you and you guys produce vehicles off the same platforms. But people still get it in their minds that I own a Jeep, not a Dodge. Hmm. Even though they are sibling, not on the product range, but on the corporate range. Sibling rivalries always benefit one company more than the other, with one of them becoming even bigger than the other. Jeep is bigger than essentially Dodge, so essentially people would automatically look at those and internally not want to associate with Dodge. Similar to that of back in the day between Pontiac and Chevrolet, or even DeSoto and Dodge, or how about even Mercury and Ford before the 1950s. Mercury is supposed to be the mid-tier brand, but by the 19 1980s, it was just another Ford brand. Those siblings fought it out, and eventually one of them would pay the price. Dodge beat out Plymouth, Ford beat out Mercury, and Chevrolet beat out Pontiac. Sometimes the bitter feud comes down to the finances in the end. The Mercury Capri never sold as much as the Ford Mustang because the Mustang is a more powerful name, even though the Capri had better features and a better special edition. But with the destruction of brands like Mercury, Pontiac, and Plymouth, these siblings were lost, and their rivalries never really really ended. The rivalry between the caravan and the town country, that one, went as long as it possibly could. But in the end, the Voyageur was the last name to live on in that product range. So is that really the sibling that won the day? The Liberty lasted longer than the Nitro, and that sibling rivalry was tooth and nail. There are a lot of sibling rivalries out in the world, and car companies are still going to produce them. They're going to want to get into these and showcase to the world that we can sell products that are better than our own internal brand or our sister brand or our stepsister brand, and it'll still exist. Everybody just sees it as platform technology. They want to make the most money off of that same platform. And through car marriages or alliances, we get products all along those same product ranges. But we can also create a bitter dispute amongst each other, which will help boost one side over the other. Nobody ever saw a Dodge Durango as a luxury product, but when the Chrysler Aspen came out, that's all people saw. And that was a rivalry that really took its toll on Chrysler Corporation, where they thought they could build something to go after a market within their own marketplace, where its own consumers saying, no, we still want our Durango. Rivalries in and amongst car companies are a big part of market saturation. Trying to get products out to the biggest part of the masses, all along the same product range with both companies benefiting from the financial gain of gaining more market share within them. The Supra and Z4 were, were it. BMW wanted to keep it roadster market alive and keep those customers still coming into their doorsteps. Where Toyota wanted to bring back its performance product to compete against the 350Z, Godzilla, and even the RX-7s, and even the NSX. They wanted to compete against these products that they once competed against in the past. Essentially, when the market falls, that's when it dictates a winner. Because in the end, either these marriages will break down, the alliances will break up, or internally, one company will fail. Not all siblings will last forever. The Master B Series and Ford Ranger are siblings of each other from the very beginning, but today are built of two completely different product lines. There is no rivalry amongst those two products. Even in their markets that they exist today together, end, the rivalry is not there. It's a rivalry between both Mazda and Ford who are not associated with each other anymore. The rivalry will keep going and companies will still hate each other and internally will still fight it out. Because even in today's marketplace, you got Chevy, Buick, and Cadillac, but essentially they still build all the same products and similar product lines have the exact same products on them. Chevy Travers, Buick Enclave, and Cadillac CT6 all share the same platform. There was once a Saturn Outlook on that as well and GMC Acadia. These siblings are keep going, but they change and the 
rivalry is still there. You may think they compete on different levels, but these siblings are competing against each other. And all the way till their final demise, siblings will fight it out. One of them will want to win, and in the end, there will always be one winner. Even if the market share keeps them alive for as long as possible, during that feud, there's always a winner. One with better market share, one with better looks, one with better pricing. Sibling rivalries are here, and automotive companies know that creating internal sibling rivalries amongst product ranges and amongst their own consumers could be more beneficial towards themselves. So they're going to keep going with sibling rivalries. Today, you don't see a lot of them. Fiat teamed up with Mazda to build a Roadster, which essentially was supposed to be a non-competing product similar with the Z4 and Super range. But at the last minute, Fiat decided to change it, created the Fiat Spider, and went head-to-head with the Mazda Miata. Mazda doesn't want that because they want to hold their market share. In a market of today, Mazda doesn't want to give up any of the market share that they own to anyone else. And since they don't have any other divisions, they're good to go it alone. With companies like Honda and Acura, there's a difference. The last NSX was only sold as an Acura. But previous to that, it was originally the Honda and Acura. Sure, there's no major rivalry between the two of them, but there is a rivalry of as to who owns the right to the original name. Who is the more complacent in the world? Well, since it was sold as the Honda NSX anywhere else in the world, the first generation is more of a Honda product than an Acura product. But because the North American marketplace is a little bit bigger and a little more influential, the Acura NSX became the all-time winner in that rivalry. Internally, when it returned, it returned as the Acura NSX and not a Honda anymore. It did that because internally the sibling brands competed against each other and in the end, only one wins. Just like in life. Siblings will always fight it out and in the end, there truly is only one winner. But they'll compete back and forth, increasing on one side and decreasing on the other. Siblings will always fight it out and always be neck and neck. Why do car companies do it? To gain more market share, essentially. To get more money off the same product product by competing in the same product lineup with two internal car companies. They do it to hold more of the market share and gain more of the value against the competition. Siblings are here to compete against each other, but essentially in the end, they're only here for the greater good of the entire family. Sibling rivalries are big money and big gain for major companies that can actually pull it off properly. In the end, there will only be one true winner, but until that day, this rivalry is going strong. So if you like this podcast, please like, share, or comment on any of the major social feeds, streaming services, or websites you found the Autolux podcast on. And after that, go stop by the website, check it out, read some of the ratings, check out some of the reviews, check out the Corporate Links website page, and find car companies, big or small. We have them all on the Autolux.net website. The Autolux podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by Podbeam.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email over at email at Autolux.net or find us on any of the streaming sites, follow us, like like us, share us, comment to let us know what you think about the Autolux podcast. So for myself, Everett Jay, the Ecom Entertainment Group, and the Podbeam.com website, strap yourself in for this one fun wild ride this sibling rivalry will take us on.